All right, let's begin. My name is Ed Stringham, and I am the president of the American Institute for Economic Research. We are an educational not-for-profit, and we were founded in 1933, in large part to have an economic analysis, a rational economic analysis of the events that were going on at the time, specifically associated with the Great Depression and a lot of the regulations associated with it. We've been uh, continuing on for the past uh, 87 years, and we've been actually uh, covering a lot of topics, and one of the ones we've been covering a lot recently, it's been in the news a lot, <laughs> as you can guess, COVID-19, otherwise known by its broad category, the coronavirus. And it turns out that there's been a lot of uh, uh, people getting worried, obviously, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, people debating in different ways. And we want to have a reasoned and uh, uh, thoughtful discussion here that you might not see on your local news. I want to just mention a couple of um, uh, just technical things. We have our, uh, our uh, Q&A box at the bottom of the screen where you can post your questions and uh, my colleagues will be sending uh, some of those to me and I apologize if we don't have the ability to get to all. Well, luckily we have 300 participants already, uh, uh, hundreds of people sign up for this event. So thank you so much for uh, taking your time to be here. We also have a chat, uh, box on the um, bottom of the Zoom screen, and you can chat there as well. I'm not going to be able to uh, follow everything there, but uh, feel free to talk among yourselves. And I just want to, uh, again, thank uh, you, our audience, to, uh, for being here. And I want to thank our specific esteemed guests. And so I will introduce them briefly and then we can get into our discussion. First, I'd like to thank Gordon Charlock, who is one of the floor governors of one of my favorite institutions in the world, the New York Stock Exchange, that great esteemed institute, institution. And I also want to, uh, uh, Gordon is a, a friend of mine. He's uh, also the managing director at uh, Rosenblatt, securities and I believe at this point they have the most seats on the New York Stock Exchange. Gordon can uh, uh, fill in the details later. Gordon's a very smart guy and also a very entertaining guy. So uh, Gordon, feel free to uh, share some of your uh, your typical stock exchange banter uh, with the, uh, the, the guests today. The next person I'd like to introduce is my friend and colleague Jeffrey Tucker. Jeffrey Tucker is the editorial director at the American Institute for Economic Research. I've known Jeffrey Tucker now since uh, 1996, and I'm just so thrilled that we get to work together. He's been doing such an amazing job with uh, editorial that I'm pleased to report our, our uh, traffic, our web traffic has been uh, going through the roof, especially the last a couple of years that he's been here and, and, and even more recently, we've been uh, surpassing a lot of our, all of our competitors actually in terms of, uh, of web, web traffic, the American Economic Association, National Bureau of Economic Research. And this week in American uh, uh, traffic, we just surpassed <laughs> the Hartford Current. So I'm very uh, happy about that. Thank you, Jeffrey Tucker for uh, making all that possible. And then uh, uh, last, I will also uh, invite another friend of mine Pete and colleague, Peter Earl. Peter Earl also works as an economist, a research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research, and uh, has spent about a couple of decades working as a trader on Wall Street and has a, just a wealth of knowledge about financial markets, but just uh, more broadly economics 
in general. So I hope that uh, everybody uh, appreciates the opportunity to get to uh, uh, see these esteemed colleagues we have. And I will also mention Peter Earl just came out with, uh, we just came out with a edited volume called Coronavirus and Economic Crisis, uh, edited by Peter Earl and uh, highlighting a lot of our recent articles on this. And um, if you act not, no, just kidding. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, to check it out. All right, so I'll just start with a couple of words and then I will uh, 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 open up to the, the panelists and then we can have a back and forth and then get to the uh, question and answer period with the, the uh, audience and you out there. So thank you for, for your time. The thing that I'd like to say that I found a little bit uh, shocking about all of this is, is well, A, the, the amount of time that you see people talking about it, it's all over the news, nothing else is covered at this point. And then uh, the other thing I found very surprising was the amount that it is really affecting the world, not just uh, health-wise, but also economic consequences as well when we see uh, various supply chains disrupted internationally. And also in the United States when people can't do certain businesses that they were used to uh, engaging in. So seeing how much connection there have, there is around the world between us and other countries and then uh, within each country, how much we depend on each other and what happens when a force, whether that's a virus or whether that is a set of um, rules, prevents us from interacting with others around the world and in the United States. So that's one thing that I've, I've uh, been struck by. And the other thing I've been struck by is uh, there's so, so much extremes out there. I guess that's to be predicted, but half the people, I can, you can divide them. <laughs> it's not half and half, but there is the, the, the lie or the die positions. And one position is, oh, it's all lies. It's all lies, all made up. And the other position is, we're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. And I think that neither of those positions is helpful or true. And in the midst of this, we need to step back and think about things from a data perspective and also from a logical perspective. And uh, the last thing I'll just mention, I, I will just sh share as an example of uh, some statements that don't follow from the facts or from even authors statements are how the media will take a, an if-then statement, oftentimes from a scientist, and then state it as, this is exactly what's going to happen. So let me just give you a couple examples of this. We know from uh, Wuhan province of confirmed cases, there was a 3% death rate, whatever that number is, I forget exactly, 2%, 3%. Therefore, 3% of Americans are going to die. This is a very common style of reasoning and statistical inferences that you hear. Or you'll hear Neil Ferguson, the scientist from England, say something like, under the worst case scenario, if the disease turns out to be very deadly and if it spreads very quickly, and the medical system in England is overwhelmed, then 500,000 people in England could die. And then immediately the media says, ah, 500,000 people are going to die. And uh, unfortunately, they don't report the if and the then statements as part of his discussion. A couple weeks later, he had a follow-up and he said, well, it looks like it's spreading more slowly. It looks like the UK health system will be able to uh, deal with it more effectively. So maybe under uh, my re revised 
assessment, it's possible that maybe 20,000 people will die. And immediately the media said, oh, look at him, he's so, he's terrible. He, he's changing his numbers all the time. And what they're not realizing is these are if and then statements. And uh, as recently as this week, Fauci said something similar to a reporter. He said, look, there's ranges here. We don't know with certainty the outcomes. And uh, we always have to be talking about ranges and updating them as we can see how uh, disease is spreading and how hospitals can deal with it. And he said, but it's possible that 200,000 people could die, but don't, don't hold me to that. Immediately, all of the press says, oh, 200,000 people, he said it, they're all gonna die. And so I think this is the type of uh, thinking from a logical point of view and from a statistics point of view that we want to, to avoid. And then also we can uh, think about some of the policy implications of some of that. So uh, with that, I will open it up to uh, my colleagues here and just get your thoughts and maybe uh, uh, just start out with what are some of the things that you've been most surprised by in the last couple weeks? Gordon. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, by way of introduction, I'd like to just uh, tell the audience that uh, I started on Wall Street in uh, 1983, <clears throat> went over to the New York Stock Exchange in 1987, became a floor trader in 1990, then in 1997 had the good fortune of um, running into Gregory Van Kipnis, formerly known as Greg Kipnis, and he introduced me to handheld technology and that was a, a major turning point for me and explains my longevity down there. It also explains why I became somewhat of a media personality and was hired for uh, appearances on CNBC. I present that all so that I can follow up with the disclosure that these opinions are mine and not of Rosenblatt or CNBC. So that's my backdrop. Now let's just talk about what's going on with us on the floor. We were trading uh, less than two weeks ago Friday and a few folks and they were they were doing a fabulous job. They were they had guys coming in hazmat suits at night, and they were getting the place spick and span and disinfected. And then we came in, and there was medical personnel. Um, as we walked in the door, asked us some questions, looked in our eyes, took our temperature, and anybody who showed any symptoms was denied access. And then they were given a test. Uh, a few folks, not too, not many, just a handful maybe, um, tested positive. And it was because of that that the stock exchange felt that it was prudent to try to stop the spread there on the floor. So that's the story of, of what's happening on the floor. Now, I know a lot of your viewers are um, around the globe. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in New York, New York City. And that is what we're seeing is um, this uncertainty about how this spreads, how quickly it'll spread, and how quickly it's going to fill up our hospitals and tax our infrastructure. With all that uncertainty, the, uh, it seems that the medical professionals themselves are under tremendous pressure to try to stay ahead of, of what's going on here. So there, there's you know, a, a lot of uh, confusion, uncertainty, and then the question of where does leadership come from in this kind of case? Well, I think that the core issue here is the, the distinction between the federal government and the state government. I mean, this is something that has gone back to the Federalist Papers and the, the founding of our country. Where does the responsibility for the federal government begin and end, and where does the responsibility of the state government begin and end? And I think that this is where you're having um, some confusion in terms of the way policy is being vetted. So now you're seeing originally that there were just some um, local examples of states succumbing to uh, stay at home uh, type policies. But now the question becomes, is that enough? And really the goal of any policy 
should be to get America back to work as soon as we possibly can. So what is the best way to do that? And I think that from where I'm sitting, the thing we have to do is get the virus under control to the best of our ability. The question is, have we done so presently? I think the numbers bear out, no, that the virus is still spreading. So I think the first point of order is to try to obviously um, knock the curve down, get it to the spot where we're not increasing the cases. Then the next thing is do testing because people that who are asymptomatic can still spread it. And then once we have developed a certain level of comfort that we have got the situation under control within the confines of the, the, uh, the capacity of the medical establishment, then it should be let's go back to work. How quickly will that happen? I think that depends on how quickly people adhere to good practice. But unfortunately, not everybody is doing it voluntarily. So now you have the situation where how does one um, promote, promote it in such a way that those people that aren't abiding by it and therefore ruining for everybody um, start to uh, pay attention to the rules. And right. so is, should that be federally mandated? Should that be state by state? I think we're getting to the point where the federal government is going to have to intervene. All right, well, thank you so much, Gordon. I uh, definitely echo the importance of, of getting back to work. There was a, uh, a sentiment a few years, a few weeks ago, rather, where it was not even thinking about some of the ramifications of some of the more um, uh, potentially draconian measures out there and, and looking at what would happen if we destroy the economy in the process. And I hope that uh, uh, Pete Earl can jump in in a couple minutes about some of the different ways that they've dealt with this in some of the different countries. And uh, maybe in the short run right now, Jeffrey Tucker, can you talk about some of the things that you've noticed that you've been most surprised by in the last few weeks? Sure. You know, I, I, we started writing about this in, in January 27th, and the, the very first article we had was um, about the quarantine power. And it was a, an article citing the CDC's quarantine power. And we got a, a flood of objections to this, like, this is alarmist. This could never happen in the United States of America. This is, you know, why, how could you have run such a ridiculous article? Uh, we'll never face uh, forced quarantines and, and crackdowns and police banging on your door telling you you've got to go to, um, you know, somewhere else, or you can't travel, and this sort of thing. So th this just illustrates how quickly everything has uh, changed. Um, this, and and since January twenty seventh, we've been constantly on this, running three to four to five articles a day, uh, covering various aspects of it. You know, the reason for the hospital shortages. You know, there's sp specific reasons for that. It's one of the greatest calamities on the ground. A lot of that has to do with uh, you know a, a couple of things. I mean, the the, t the tariffs against China came along at exactly the wrong time. That's why Peter Earl and I immediately wrote an article about the need to repeal the, t the tariffs immediately. Uh, the CDC's delays on testing, which has been widely covered in the press, thank goodness, you know, for the, the Atlantic or the New York Times. Or, um, this is one of the great scandals uh, that, that, that two months went by where they were cracking down on private uh, uh, testing, you know, from, um, and, and one, one great researcher, Dr. Chu from Seattle in a, in a, in a in a private laboratory funded by the Gates Foundation, um, had developed a test and couldn't distribute it, and finally just decided to uh, just innovate around the FDA and the CDC. What this left us with, and, and one of the articles I wrote pretty early on, was that what this ultimately is is an epistemic crisis. So, as Hyatt pointed out, you know, in, in any kind of well-functioning society, can you tell us what epistemic means? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a silly word. <laughs> <laughs> but it means basically what you know. And uh, Hayek's view is that market signals and, and knowledge of the way society works. That's how we figure out what is successful action, uh, uh, what we should buy and when, and, and um, um, how, how we should conduct our lives. And so when a disease comes along, it's the most important thing that we, we have signals, that we understand who has it, whether I have it, how can I get it. Um, that we have as much knowledge as possible. Unfortunately, we did not have this knowledge um, um, 
Am I still on camera? I guess everything's okay. We did not have, we were not gaining access to this knowledge because of uh, various blockages. And it's, it's really the great scandal. And so this led, what happened was that the ignorance uh, uh, that, that we were all had was replaced by power. And this is what I find the most uh, stri striking aspect of all this stuff in, in a country where we've prided ourselves on the rule of law and your constitution and, and, and a fundamental, you know, belief in freedom, that sort of thing. Um, the immediate response was crackdown. And then that became its own kind of virus. You know, the shutdown orders, the clampdowns are, right now, it's not even clear you can drive around town without, without a paper declaring your essential business. And, and, and you look at the state orders on what's essential and what's not essential. And it, and it feels like you're reading a dystopian novel. Absolutely shocking. Just this complete absence of confidence that, that individuals can figure this out. Society can figure this out on its own. Um, so we've been kind of out front and editorializing about this. And, you know, in the midst of all this stuff, I, I, I visited several, uh, several times in South Korea and I have a lot of friends there. So I follow them on Instagram. So in the midst of this crisis, <laughs> I'm getting posts from, from South Korea where everybody's at, at restaurants. Uh, you know, people are out and about shopping. Life's continuing on as normal. People are going to gyms and uh, they, they dealt with the crisis very well. They had widespread testing, widespread knowledge, perfect calm and a drive to, to, to enliven enterprise and not sacrifice people's lives and jobs. Um, in other words, a focus on mitigating the disease, you know, with medical professionals uh, driving the things forward. And the same thing uh, happened in Sweden. Britain started that way and then there was this panic, mostly as a result of the statistical modeling by Neil Ferguson and these various numbers that Edward was showing out earlier that has sent the entire political class into a panic. And so the U.S. has been in a state of kind of a meltdown just because of the absence of knowledge. And now, look at, look at it, what's happening. Everybody's click, click, clicking on the computer, uh, trying to find data. What's the death rates? What are the infection rates? What is, what's the uh, case fatality rate? Um, you know, is this a mild cold as it is for a lot of people? Am I going to feel any symptoms at all as it is for a lot of people? Is it kind of a... Uh, an annoying, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a vexing uh, two-day flu as it is for a lot of people, or is it fatal as it is for a very small um, minority? There's a lot we don't know. Uh, people keep talking about death rates. There is no way to calculate the death rate without a good uh, uh, denominator, reliable denominator. In other words, you have to have testing. Uh, let me, I, I don't want to just take up all my time here, but let me just... Um, uh, say, say the following thing about this matter. And then one last comment about um, the long-term ramifications. Of There's actually two comments, but about the denominator. It's possible, as you've probably been reading, maybe, that this virus has been in the U.S. since December. Uh, anecdotally, it seems true. We can't prove that because we didn't have tests. We've only recently had tests and they're still being severely rationed. Probably if you want one, you can't get one. These people got corona, they got over it, that will never be in the denominator. So it's in some sense not even possible for us to get a rac accurate rendering of the case f fatality rate right now. Those days are done. Um, everything that's been done is done, including the unemployment um, uh, numbers. Well, we can, we can look in the future once more people get tested and uh, yeah. see if they have help. antibodies in their blood and then see, okay, looks like this person is immune. We're just so far away from that. I think that uh, uh, Pete wrote a very interesting article about the importance of mitigation. We don't want to have, if it's uh, as fatal as, as uh, many people believe, we want to have it ripped through society so quickly and uh, all of a sudden overrun our hospitals. And uh, uh, Pete has an article yes. discussing that in different ways that different countries have done that. And one country I think that the data looks pretty good on at this point in terms of, uh, of uh, lowering new cases and lowering fatalities in addition to China is also Korea. So maybe uh, Pete, if you could just in general, uh, 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 comment on Korea and, and talk about a little bit about what, what did they do? 
Sure. So uh, uh, one of the things is that um, Korea had experienced from the H1N1 and also from the SARS epidemics. That's 2009 and 2003, respectively. And um, so when this happened, they were more set up for it. But what they did was they, 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 they seem to have more respect or at least a more of appreciation for the open society and for commercial interactions between people. So one of the first things they did was they set up drive-through testing sites and they took down people's information. So after being tested, people would know within about three hours if they were sick or not. And then they asked people to basically stay at home and self-isolate. And they focused on isolating people who were sick and not entire families or entire geographic areas. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not going to hold uh, the South Korean policy response out as some, you know, uh, 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 enlightened uh, version of, uh, say, free markets or whatever, because they employed uh, elements of surveillance and uh, that sort of thing to attract people who were who tested positive or seemed sick. But in general, they've been able to keep their their commercial sector alive and uh, and keep people transacting and um, you know basically not shut down the entire uh, business sector uh, the way that the U.S. has done. And just something else I wanted to mention is that, you know, one of the things that, that, that becomes, I think we all know, but it becomes really apparent during a situation like this, is that the incentives for government are always to go overboard. There's never any reason for them to either be, to, 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 to sort of present half solutions or anything like that. It's always shut it down, close it off, tax it, put a tariff on it, that sort of thing. And as long as that's the case, until we can find a way to sort of change those incentives, this is going to be the reaction every time. Because there are no rewards for politicians for sitting on the sidelines. It's always going to be the most radical. You know, they almost try to sort of one-up one another, whether it's governors or, or, or congressmen or, or even the president. They always try to one-up each other in terms of their, um, their policy response. So that's, that's a dynamic that needs to be changed. Perhaps more skin in the game, something like that. Great. Yeah, I really uh, was interested by an epidemiologist's recent comments from uh, Sweden. And what he said in Sweden, they have much more of a trust in the medical profession and they, they will weigh in on them and say, what do you recommend? Uh, as opposed to just putting those decisions in the hands of politicians in many cases who haven't studied, studied things. I know that in certain small towns, they're um, even much more draconian than the, uh, the federal, federal recommendations, which, you know, they've got, they've got scientists on the uh, federal task force and a lot of these local mayors are just going at this, you know, it's all new to them. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about briefly is just uh, the, the effects, you know, we can, one can have a debate, because we, we don't know about how how deadly it's going to be until we get more data and, and, and how we're going to deal with it. It looks like uh, New York hospitals is going to peak in, in the middle of, of April and then ideally start going down after that maybe. Uh, but we don't know those at this point. But one thing we can talk about is some of the economic effects. We do know that. And uh, uh, later we can talk about maybe some other ways we could have dealt with some of these things. But but I was shocked, really, just to see how far the uh, stock market has gone down. Uh, Pete, you can tell us this was the the largest one in, in uh, decrease in, in how how long? Yeah, the uh, the 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 month of of March 2020 is the worst since I believe it's March of 1931, which was 33 and change percent. This was this month was down 40 uh, uh, over uh, something. I'm saying I have to check. I don't know the exact numbers, but it was the worst worst month on record going back to the Great Depression. And of course, we had uh, nobody. Uh, you know, I, I follow uh, definitions a little wonkily, but we also had our first stock market crash in 33 years. The day that the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was down uh, uh, 12 12.93, I believe, just before just short of 13 percent. So um, a, lot of, a lot of what we're doing today is dusting off uh, books for, to find out how do you define a crash, how do you define a depression, things like that. Hopefully we won't have to define a depression, but if we do, um, uh, I've been looking into it. <laughs> yeah, great. And can you share your joke you, you, you shared with me the other day? Oh, yeah, I said, uh, I said uh, what do you call it 
when the VIX is in backwardation, when the uh, yield curve is negative and inverted, and when, when the Fed is buying convertible bond ETFs, and I can't remember another, but anyway, the answer was Thursday. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Uh, Gordon, if you could maybe just share some of your, you know, personal experiences, observations of, of you know, what is it like? You, you've been around, you've been around the block a few times, and uh, uh, what, you know, what is it like when, when you just see these numbers going down uh, so much, and what, what is just the reaction you see? Well, first, from a, from, a, from a floor perspective, I'm going to have to tell Peter, he's got to tell his jokes faster than that because they, they never <laughs> stick around, okay? So that's number one. But the thing is, there were a couple of um, things that happened on the floor that were kind of unique. One of the things that they... We're all waiting for your joke, Gordon. Come on, get to the punchline, Jordan. All right, <laughs> I, I think we lost him. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll ask him this question when he gets back. We, uh, we don't see you, Gordon. But, uh, but, but Pete, so we've got huge, huge decreases in, in prices and, and how would you how would you describe that? Is it is that reflecting? You know, prices reflect future profitability, bet current estimates of future profitability of of current corporations, and if they're decreasing by such a large amount, I mean, you, do you think that's an accurate reflection of the economic problems that we're going to see moving forward? So, I mean, when it comes to uh, what happens in the stock market, of course, it's important to remember that stocks are basically titles to aggregates of capital goods. Those capital goods produce earnings, and that's, what, that's one of the ways that we base the, the valuation of stocks is upon, you know, uh, for example, price to earnings ratio, that sort of thing. So when the market was falling the way it was, it's essentially one way, you know, we used to say, you know, markets, uh, markets uh, they, 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 bad news is one thing. That is as bad, but 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 uncertainty is worse. So when the stock market is falling, or you know, when other when any other instrument is falling that way, it's essentially looking for a bottom. There was no no information upon which to sort of base how low earnings would go, and that's why they fell so much. And it took you know even bad news um, about either infection rates or about government policies and, or the spread overseas and that sort of thing. It takes that sort of information to sort of allow the market and mostly market participants to sort of get their arms around it and start to provide a basis for valuing these securities in terms of what they think their earnings will be. And, you know, when, when you see a sort of a, just a, a, a sort of a bottomless pit under, it's because there's no information and there's really no reason to hang around if you don't know the basis upon which these things should be valued. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, so let's, let's get into some, uh, some questions here. And, uh, uh, this one is from from Dean, my my neighbor here, uh, and I'll let Jeffrey answer this. If more of the public was inoculated against economic falsehoods, would the government be able to take all of such actions? I'm going to add into that all of the the actions that they have taken, and and the follow up is what is the root cause of economic illiteracy? Well, economics is not is not taught like it should be, but you know, life can be a great teacher in economics. And I would say, uh, the consumer experience over the last several weeks has really uh, taught this. One of the things we have in this country is price gouging laws, um, not at all levels, not at all ways, but there's a general sense that you could get in trouble if you raise your prices. Well, we saw what happened uh, over the last month with with white gold, also also known as toilet paper. Uh, it it just disappeared. It would have been nice if grocery stores could have rationed this, you know, using the price system, but they couldn't and didn't. And as a result, it all just disappeared. And now it's reappearing. And it's stores instead of raising the prices or giving limits on how much you can buy and that sort of thing. Look, 
I, I don't want to let this seminar uh, go too much longer without shouting hooray to the private sector. Um, despite being hobbled and attacked and brutalized with these essential versus unessential distinctions, which I find uh, egregious, morally egregious, um, it has responded so magnificently. The way in which Amazon has retooled itself you know, completely. They even, I don't know if you know this, but three days ago, um, actually, since half their workers are afraid even to show up to work because of, of the corona panic, um, they had to limit shipments into their own warehouses. So they had to make not for sale uh, a, a tremendous number of products uh, just to retool and, and refigure and get, get a grip on themselves. And now it, they've, they've, they've made those products uh, live again, among which is, our, is our, our book. But just the sheer adaptability of private enterprise has just been nothing short of heroic. And I wish... Well, and I don't know how anybody could look at the current environment in America today and not realize this. You know, what is the government doing by comparison to the private sector? I mean, it's, it's threatening you and it's arresting you. It's giving you these barking orders based on knowledge they don't have and so on. So private sector uh, adapts and shifts and is desperate to get you what you need so you can have a good life. I mean, I hope that this will be a great economic teacher for people and drive people to the books, you know, uh, from E.C. Harwood or Edward Stringham or Henry Hazlitt or Friedrich Bastiat to understand economics. Economics is not something you can just wish away. It is part of our lives. The struggle to allocate scarce resources and create more so we can have wealth creation is the essence, it's the pith of civilization, as Ludwig von Mises called it. And I hope this drives people to a, a passion to, to try to understand. In fact, I think it will. I think we all know that we're living through the greatest disruption uh, of our lives in many, many gener generations. It's going to disrupt government, um, the social order, the culture, the economy. And I think, actually, I have to say, I don't think I'm not pessimistic. I think in the, in the end, we're gonna come through this and we're going to rethink a lot of things, a lot of government regulations that we didn't need, whether it's the CDC or restrictions on medical care or building hospitals or, or approving drugs or, or, uh, 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 or workers in the gig economy and so on. I think a lot of the apparatus that's held us back, that's been in, in place, but we only now kind of bump into it in this terrible way. Um, a lot of that will be wiped out, I think. Yeah, my favorite is in uh, Western Massachusetts. They've legalized plastic bags again in grocery stores. So there's kind of this long st standing sentiment about certain people. I'll just call it unsanitary. And uh, I think we should be very thankful for these corporations, the, the Purell Corporation. I don't know who makes that. If that's whoever, whatever company, or, or, or for that matter, 3M. Uh, without 3M, we, we wouldn't have all these new COVID, I mean, we would have some competitors, but they've ramped up the production of these uh, coronavirus masks, the N95 or 85 masks, I forget the name of it, from $250 million uh, per year to $1 billion per year. And without such a large corporation, I think uh, we would be in a lot more difficult situation. So uh, we got Gordon back. I missed you, Gordon. I thought you were actually telling a joke and seeing how long you could do to get to the punchline. No, actually, I got attacked by a coronavirus. I had to just throw him out the window and now I'm back. So don't worry, we're right. in good shape here. But right. I was just we talking about talking some of the things we were talking about in yeah. terms of the way the trading floor behaved. And it's, you know, they're going to develop um, it's, a, it's a learning experience when the markets are that volatile, volatile and there's that much volume in the room. It's a, it taxes the systems. I mean, you know, these extraordinary events, you always learn a lot from them. You, you can never truly prepare all the way for, but it's extremely important that we keep the markets open. And as Jeffrey says, if, you know, private sector and then the confidence in the private sector and the ability to buy and sell stocks and knowing that the markets are there deep and liquid is essential to, to uh, it's fundamental to capitalism. But I think, you know, also to Jeffrey's point, we're, we're learning a lot of things, not just about trading, but we're learning something about our country and, and what we need to do going forward. One of the things that 
the, the Fed did, um, the Treasury Secretary rightly, was they s supplied the money uh, to backstop um, the, the financial system. And, and this was critically important and you know, it'd be applauded to do that. Of course, they probably have it backstopped to about 100% of GDP. So the question is, where is that money going? How, how are they going to use it? Because if they don't use it effectively and we're saddled with all that debt, then we have a problem that's going to take a long time to straighten out if we really ever can, or, or we end up spiraling into some sort of depression type state, uh, high unemployment. So the thing is, we have to now look at what happened here and realize that we probably are too dependent on uh, other countries to supply us with essential goods and services. So we need to develop an infrastructure, but an infrastructure for this time, not just roads and highways and bridges, but medical supplies, um, maybe 5G networking, all these kinds of things. And they could be quasi partnerships uh, between the government and uh, the private sector like space travel is now. But we, we need to adapt our country to this new paradigm. And America has to be a leader here and be the one <clears throat> that everybody calls, not somebody that has to make an outgoing call to get supplies and services for American people. Great, yeah, I've been interested uh, in uh, how they've streamlined a lot of uh, the regulatory processes with certain uh, things and, and just allowing other companies to start producing new things. So um, there's been a lot of liberal economic liberalization uh, associated with this. Cuomo has cut back certain various regulations. Um, all right, so now let's get to uh, uh, some other questions. I'll ask this to Peter. What would be the best economic, this is from Fred, the best economic vaccine well, in my mind, the best economic vaccine would be to swiftly, uh, as close to instantaneously as possible, withdraw all the government fetters that interfere with people transacting with each other and prices from moving the way they could or should and keep goods and, 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 and services and information and, and, and expertise flowing. That, to me, is, is, would be the quickest way to get things going again. To, I mean, I, I personally would, would, would go for a permanent, uh, you know, a permanent uh, uh, ending of it. But I mean, even temporarily, uh, you know, getting rid of minimum wage, getting rid of a lot of the regulations to keep things from from flowing, get, getting rid of uh, uh, certain limitations on uh, the way goods can be sold and all that sort of thing, getting rid of all of the, the, of the gouging laws and all that sort of thing. The, 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 the right economic vaccine would be a healthy dose of freedom. And then maybe, who knows? It might, it might it might work out so well. They might uh, some of them might uh, uh, stick around. But even if just temporarily, that would would be the jolt I think we need to make this a V shaped, a V in a very narrow shaped uh, recession or depression, and not you know a long drawn out sort of thing as we've seen in the past. Well, thanks. One of the things that I I found very interesting is uh, it shows how interdependent all of the nations are, especially us on China and, and other countries, because even before it, the disease came here, we started seeing this showing up in, in markets, especially there, but with the uh, supply chain disruptions. So uh, uh, one of the lessons I think we could get from this is that when China is supplying us all these goods and then when they can't supply us all these goods, that's a lost opportunity for us and, and we need to, to realize this. Uh, I want to mention an interesting medical doctor from Cornell Weill Hospital in Manhattan named David Price. If I, people haven't seen this video, I'd really recommend it. And he's in the emergency room. He's a, a pulmonologist or pulmonary doctor. I don't know how to pronounce the uh, title. And um, he said that as he's learned more about the science of how people get it and uh, how it's transmitted, he's gotten actually a lot more hopeful. And he said that it's not as dangerous as previously thought, where he said one person touches a surface and then five people or 10 people get it. He said it's really, uh, in most cases, 
you know, shaking hands with somebody who gets it and then touching one's face. And he said, if you follow these strict protocols by using Purell a lot, he said, you're not going to get it. And he said that he is not at all feeling worried about that, even though he is in working in the front lines at Cornell Wheel in Manhattan. So I thought that was kind of good. And we can kind of think of uh, maybe that strategy as an alternative to the very draconian, we're gonna keep people out of work for two months strategy. Uh, the Purell mandate or the Purell standard uh, as an alternative to the gold standard, we can uh, adopt as money Purell. You could store it, it's divisible, it's easily transportable, has all the characteristics of a, uh, a, a commodity money, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a hard currency. I'll be looking very for all futures. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Jeffrey, I've got a question here from uh, um, uh, Joseph. How do we get the economy moving again? Does Say's law apply here? I'm also gonna, uh, that's from Jim actually, and from Joseph, I'm gonna also add, uh, which lessons from economics can best inform political leaders about how to respect constitutional boundaries in society between expert information and political authority control. My own feeling about this, and I, you know, I can't be sure of it, is that I, I don't, I think after this happens, people are going to, people right now are in, in tremendous shock. They, they didn't know the government had this amount of power. They didn't understand uh, that their lives could be taken away from their business, could be shut down, they could be shut into the house, basically under house arrest. Uh, it, it's, you know, this is, this is an education that's going to last generations probably in the nature of government power. And I'm fully expecting a huge public push against this. And I, it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, I, probably you're sitting out there right now going, the American people are stupid. Nobody knows anything. What's with all the howls for government to do stuff? Um, how come every single media personality is is demanding that Trump be more of a dictator than he is, you know, and, and crack down? I would urge you to look beneath the surface. There's a lot of shock and anger already in this country about what's happened, that the people's lives have been taken away from them and their jobs are destroyed by arbitrary e edict and the complete lack of trust that our political leaders have shown in the capacity of a free people to manage their own lives. I mean, th this is a shock. And, and, and the other thing I think you learn by watching is just the sheer adaptability of markets in light of this thing. It's been awe-inspiring at every single level. I mean, when I look at restaurants that suddenly went full takeout, you know, and they got takeout boxes that they didn't previously have. That's just one example. There are millions and millions, hundreds of millions of examples of the adaptability of markets. This is extremely prescient to us. We see government on the one hand just cracking down with irrational contradictory orders. On the other hand, markets constantly delivering the goods, constantly bouncing back. And I think that once the liberalization happens, and it will happen, um, I, I'm already starting to feel it a little bit. There was a town in Georgia that said, all right, figure out what the stay at home orders, just manage yourself. We'll, we'll mitigate the disease, we'll handle this on our own, but we're not gonna ruin your lives uh, uh, under, the, under the cover of the disease. So we're starting to see the liberalization, the thaw is happening gradually. Um, and, and then all at once. Uh, so just, just give it time, keep your hopes up, keep hope alive, you know, don't despair. The, the liberalization is coming and then I'm really expecting things to roar back very, very quickly. People use the word recession, they use the word depression, they compare it to the Great Depression, they compare it to the pandemics of the past and, and, and this damage that it did for long term. I'm not sure there's any good historical comparison. My friend Gene Epstein, who edited the economics uh, section of Barron's for years and years, prefers the term great suppression. And I like that uh, word because it, it, we use the word recession and depression to use to refer to cyclical behavior of, you know, from, of, within macroeconomic structures. So exact rational exuberance of 
fueled by bad monetary policy, whatever, there's a correction and it takes a while to get out of it. That's not what's happening right now. What's happening is we had uh, an economy that was, that was hobbled, but doing very well. And then governments at all levels just said, all right, stop what you're doing. Don't do it anymore. Shocking everybody into the state of what the hell? I mean, how is this even possible? So when those strictures are lifted off, I think you're going to have people falling in love with work again, falling in love with enterprise, uh, desperate to rebuild their lives, uh, put back uh, wealth together. The velocity of money is going to collapse. I think we, based on historical episodes, we can predict that, which is to say that savings are going to go dramatically up, which is to say that once people regain confidence in the future and we can restrict uh, the uh, Le Le Leviathan's controls, then the investment starts again. And I think at the end of this, we're going to have a very a bright future on many fronts, not just the economics, right. but in politics. I, I, am, I am also uh, an optimist. Obviously, I will uh, uh, feel bad and lament for the people who will, will be affected and are, who are already affected by this disease. But um, uh, to repeat again uh, something from Dr. David Price from Cornell Well, hospital, he said, he said, as he has studied this more, he thinks that we can, we can avoid it. And, and that's really a message of hope. And uh, uh, in terms of market prices, that is also a potential uh, indicator of, of hope. We had uh, uh, VIX volatility index is a uh, bet uh, on, on how much volatility and, and bad things are gonna happen in the markets. That was at a record high of 83, and that's went down to 60 last week, and now it's at 50. That's still quite high, but not as high as it was. And then obviously the, uh, the, the general stock prices have uh, been recovering the last few days, not specifically the last uh, two or three days, but uh, in general, they've, they've gone up. So uh, Gordon, would you say that, that you think, um, you know, let's, let's hope we get through this in a way that the, the curve is flattened and not uh, too many uh, hospitals are overrun. But do you think there's an underlying strength in the, the economy that you, you would expect that, um, you know, we're not gonna be in this, this dire situation? I know a few weeks ago, you and I were talking and we were both uh, fairly optimistic about the, the long run, and I, I still am, uh, even though in the short run, things got a lot worse than, than I had predicted, uh, certainly. So uh, where, where, where do you stand on this? You think there's still an underlying strength of being able to get that investing going, those, those corporations up and running again? I think that there's a, a fundamental strength in the, in the economy. I, you, you look out there, you see a lot of banking uh, activity, you see a lot of private equity activity. But the problem continues to be, and this is where you know, I, I differ with you, Jeffrey, is that sure, it would be wonderful if people would voluntarily adhere to the guidelines. You look at Germany and you look at the, you know, everybody talks about South Korea, but if you check Germany, their fatalities are, are, are lower on a percentage base than South Korea. Why is that? Well, I was speaking to someone from over there and they said, because when the, when the government tells us this is what you need to do, they just do it. It doesn't take many people uh, in a city like New York to continue the spread and put, continue to put a strain on, on the medical uh, staffs, but also the economy, because you can't just let it go unabated. So it, it is regrettable that we, can't, that we can't see that. Nothing would be better than some sort of V-shaped correction. And, but the only way I really see that would be some sort of medical intervention, some sort of, um, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, just something that I, I know, for example, in Israel, they're working on something that can at least address the fatality portion of the disease. So it wouldn't affect anybody actually getting sick, but if they got to the spot where they were on a respirator for some period of time and it looked like they were failing, they could give them some kind of medicine. Even something as, uh, something like that would be enough to get the swagger back into the bull and get this thing turned around quickly. But short of that, and short of some sort of underlying event, to believe that it's going to come out of the, the, the 
good nature of, of the American citizen. I just don't think it's, it's going to happen that way. And, and, I, and I'm sorry that I feel that way, but I think the facts bear you out. You see, this one goes to a, ch a church service. This one goes to a beach. This one, you know, all these states where there was nobody, one person, three person, now they're, they're all showing 50, 100 people. It is spreading. And even in rural communities. So, you know, is, they see what's happening in New York. They see what's happening in metropolitan areas. And even there, they can't uh, govern themselves, self-govern themselves enough to keep their own situations uh, up and running. Their economies are being uh, uh, hit just as, you know, along with the rest of the country. So look, would it be nice if, if you could have an isolated area that would behave itself and they could conduct their business? Yeah, but it's just, you know, the, the evidence doesn't uh, support that. So we need some sort of event, some, some sort of uh, proof of concept, some sort of medical intervention to get us to a spot. Short of that, it's going to linger and we're going to continue to slog through another sloppy quarter. All right, and now a question from the chairman of the board, Gregory, the great Gregory Van Kipnis. I will ask this question to Peter Earl. And this is a question about mitigation. So we, you know, it's spreading, it's around the world, it's around the country, it's around the city. And, uh, you know, what, what can we do? And here's his question. In a world of scarcity, there's a premium for scarce resources. Is there a labor market premium for healthy COVID-19 recovered workers? If so, is it large enough to attract younger people without health complications to decide to accelerate to get COVID-19. If this is something you thought about, Peter. Yeah, so the, I mean, the answer is right now there isn't. I would expect there to be, um, but uh, uh, just uh, the two minute segue is, I was in Europe in January, uh, went to a few places, came back, got a terrible, terrible case of the flu, you know, uh, this is before people were talking about all this, uh, barricaded myself in my apartment, uh, got better, came out. And now uh, my wife and other people think, Pete, you probably had COVID-19. Uh, I don't know, eventually I'll get tested to see about the antibodies, but I would say I wouldn't recommend anybody out, go out and try to get it. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that to me is, is borders on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the psychotic, I guess, but, uh, but I mean, it, I, I would expect, especially in, 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 say, certain types of food service, or maybe uh, in terms of uh, uh, other places where you're going to have a high degree of contact uh, with people, maybe, say, uh, people work in, air, on, in airlines and stuff. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would assure you that eventually the labor market will, will, will find a niche for people who uh, have had the disease and recovered and therefore are um, you know, the market will pay a premium for people who are have proven, uh, you know, to have those antibodies and therefore not not get it or spread it. Sure, not it has it, it hasn't come out yet. That hasn't erupted yet, but I, I imagine that eventually markets will specialize in that fashion. Great. Well, uh, we want to uh, be respectful of everybody's time. We're coming on to our 59th minute. So uh, first, I want to uh, thank all of our viewers, our listeners. Uh, we've got uh, 320 people in right now, so thank you so much for your time. I also want to uh, thank, obviously, our panelists, all intelligent commentary here, uh, a little bit of uh, debate here and there, and uh, a great set of ideas. So thank you so much to, uh, to, to Gordon, to Jeffrey, to Peter. And uh, uh, if people want to learn more about some of our research on uh, COVID-19 and, and some of our commentary and discussion, you can check out Peter Earle's uh, new new book, uh, Coronavirus and Economic Crisis. And just in general, if you'd like to uh, check out our website, American Institute for Economic Research, AIR.org, where you can see a discussion on this and really just more broadly other, other topics. And then the best part about our website is you'll get to see me from time to time uh, posted me on, on television, and uh, really, I can't think of anything better than that. And uh, well, maybe after uh, the coronavirus is uh, is cured in society and markets recover, we will 
have something even better. And I hope that everybody can be optimistic and enjoy yourselves. And I will uh, thank you for your time and look forward to being in touch.